So I didn't really get much of a brief for this uh, lecture other than talk about uh, your research. So that's what, uh, that's what I'm going to do. Um, and what uh, we're interested in in my group is uh, understanding the genetic basis of uh, complex trait variation, right? So if you look around this room, you will see that you differ from each other in many obviously visible characteristics. Um, and if uh, we were to do medical workups and psych profiles and things like that, various questionnaires on everybody, uh, you would see many more uh, less obvious but very important uh, differences. Uh, many of them of high medical relevance. If we then did any kind of family um, analysis, we would find that most of these have a significant inherited component. But even today in 2016, post um, genome project, post GWAS, if we wanted to point to differences in your genomes, which we could sequence now relatively easily, which uh, um, account for those heritable genetic differences, we would not be able to do a very good job of connect, making those mappings uh, for most of the traits of interest. And it's because those relationships are uh, not in most cases, one-to-one. -one. There is one gene, one mutation that gives you a trait, but it's an interplay of many genetic factors of subtle effect. And what um, my lab uh, has focused on uh, for the last oh, dozen or so years has been trying to pull apart these complex relationships in uh, genetically more simple and tractable systems, um, uh, primarily the, ye the, bud the standard budding yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, that's used for making uh, wine and beer and bread, um, and is a great uh, system uh, to work with. So that's going to be the focus of my talk. Um, so I think I'm going to blow through some of these intro slides so we have more uh, stuff to um, more time to focus on actual uh, on actual science. So the idea here is to use um, the power of yeast genetics to dissect genetically complex traits, right? And when you, uh, the basic kind of underlying motivation is when you have um, subtle, uh, small genetic effects, and many of them, and you'd like to be able to identify them, you want to reduce additional sources of variance. So for example, all the differences among us in our environment and history and so on as we grow up. And you also like very large numbers. Um, so yeast obviously helps us with being able to closely control their growth conditions and environment. And also, whereas uh, 300 million humans looks like this, 300 million yeast looks like this. You can easily grow a very large number of yeast in a single flask, so sample size shouldn't really be limiting. And just like their most human traits are comple genetically complex and follow continuous distributions rather than falling into two simple binomial classes, their traits, for example, growth uh, um, in the presence of a certain uh, damaging chemical shown here among uh, a range of yeast strains that show similar quantitative patterns, right? So it's not an all or none thing. You range from strains that basically won't grow at all in the presence um, of this chemical to ones that grow very well and ranges of everything in between, which is one simple ind uh, indication of genetic complexity. Um, so um, when we uh, kind of embarked on trying to dissect this, the first thing you obviously do is a power calculation. And um, many of the effects that have shown up um, in studies in humans and other species are on the order of 1% of variance explained or smaller. And so um, relatively small panels of yeast that we and others have worked with on the order of 100 or so strains I, you know, basically have no power in, uh, in this effect size range. So we needed to really kind of scale up our studies into the thousands. And you see that with a thousand uh, strains of yeast, we now start to get pretty decent power, like we're well powered down to about 2% of the, for effects that explain about 2% of total trait variance. Um, and by the time you're at 4,000 strains, you're very well powered to 1% and below. Um, and the dotted lines here 
show power instead of detecting individual genetic effects to detect interactions between two different genetic effects, which is obviously a harder problem. So the power is a little lower, but once you start to get into these types of sample sizes, you start to get decent statistical power even for uh, interactions between pairs of loci. So, um, we, and this is an effort that uh, has been largely led by uh, Josh Bloom, a staff scientist uh, in the lab who comes from a computational background but has actually done a ton of the lab uh, part of the automation and setup of this project as well, um, have, uh, have been carrying out what's uh, kind of a very simple and classical yeast genetics study but massively scaled up and updated to the genomic uh, era. Um, so uh, the design here is very simple. You start with two different strains of yeast. One is uh, one that's been used for, for most laboratory studies and has been uh, largely in the lab for the last 80 or so years. And now there is a vineyard strain isolated from a California vineyard in the uh, 80s or 90s. Um, you, uh, so the, the nice kind of wrinkle for working with yeast is they're happily growing as haploids where they only have one copy of their genome, right? So we always have two. Um, but if you take two haploid strains of yeast and mate them, they'll form a diploid strain. And you could happily grow them in this diploid state or you could force this diploid uh, to, go through, to undergo meiosis. Um, and you can actually isolate um, all four products of meiosis, uh, that's called the tetrad, and then you can separate those out into individual haploid strains. Um, this has some nice um, sort of technical and statistical advantages that won't play at all in the talk today. But uh, long story short, we have about 4,000 of these progeny that are uh, roughly related to each other as uh, siblings from uh, a family with two parents, okay? Um, so how do we, so, so we want to be able to do two things. We want to be able to genotype them, so read out their genomes, right? Um, identify which chunk came from which parent, and we want to be able to measure lots of different uh, phenotypic variation in these guys. So the answer to how we do genotyping is uh, the same as it is for most things these days by just uh, high throughput short read uh, DNA sequencing. Um, so the yeast genome is uh, nice and compact. It's only about 12 megabases of DNA, right? So that's about 300 times smaller than the human genome. So as a result, um, we can use very high plexes. So for this project, we could uh, multiplex uh, 1152 samples into a single high seq lane uh, using dual uh, indexed barcodes to be able to uh, read out after the fact which strain um, the reads come from. And this gives us about one and a half X coverage uh, for each strain, which is, you know, crummy if you were trying to sequence some de, de novo, but it's just two parental genomes mixed up and all we have to be able to do is at each position say which parent's DNA they inherited. And because inheritance comes in decent sized chromosomal blocks, we have huge redundancy for doing this. Um, so this way we get uh, read out at roughly 40,000 uh, positions, single nucleotide polymorphisms at which these two strains differ. These are basically all such positions at which these two strains differ. Um, we can use an H&M to clean up these raw genotype calls and identify the breakpoints and recombination. And so he, this shows uh, just one of these 4,000 or so segregants and raw pileups of reads um, where we can identify them based on the polymorphism as coming from the lab strain, uh, from the lab strain or the vineyard strain. And then uh, the purple and orange bars are the regions that identified to be contiguously inherited from those guys. And then uh, what we typically measure in this, at least in this first part of the talk, is growth in different conditions that have, that attack like yeast's ability to grow in very different ways by targeting different cellular pathways. Um, so you can do this by measuring, by, by for example, varying the temperature that they grow, the pH at which they grow, uh, giving them different sources of carbon and nitrogen, or by um, targeting specific cellular pathways, for example, with metal ions or small, uh, or small molecule drugs. So what's shown here is one uh, trait uh, growth in cadmium chloride, which turns out is just shown here as an example because it's relatively genetically simple. Here are all these 4,000 strains growing in nice uh, yeast growth medium. 
and they all grow pretty well, although there's certainly variation just in their baseline rate of growth because they're all genetically uh, different from each other. And here they are growing on uh, cadmium chloride, and you see that roughly half the strains do a quite good job of growing in the presence of this compound, and uh, the other half basically fail to grow, right? So that tells you that this is going to be genetically pretty simple and have one big effect. Most uh, of the uh, conditions and traits we look at give a much more graded pattern. This is just visually nice to see. And by growing them in both of these conditions, we can adjust for just baseline differences in growth to get things that are specific to a certain condition. So um, we wanted to be able to do this en masse. And when we initially set up this experiment, I still like to show this slide. Um, we, it turned out that the most cost-efficient way of doing this was to buy a bunch of these uh, commodity transparency scanners from Best Buy for about 200 bucks each. Um, each one of these can hold five agar plates on which you spot your uh, yeast, and you can cram eight of them into an old like yeast growth incubator. And here is a very old uh, MacBook that was basically too old to do anything else, but it can computer control uh, these transparency scanners and get, it, get them to take pictures at regular intervals. Um, and amazingly, this whole setup survived for quite a while in a 30 degree high humidity incubator optimized for growing yeast rather than housing electronics. Um, more recently, we've scaled up to this fancy piece of robotics that costs a lot more money, but uh, works uh, nicely and is special purpose built by a little outfit in Toronto specifically for uh, high throughput yeast genetics uh, experiments. So um, you, once, you, once you take these pictures, you can obviously use uh, fairly standard image processing software uh, to measure the size of these colonies and you know, measure that over time, which gives you a growth rate. And then, um, you, so, now, so now you're set to go. You have a bunch of traits, which are uh, growth rates in all of these different conditions, and you have the genotype information for all of these strains. So what can you, what can you do with that? Um, well, so the first thing you can do is estimate uh, different con contributions of different genetic and non-genetic factors to trait variation, right? Um, and uh, to do this, we employ uh, the mixed model uh, technology of realized genetic relationships. And Eliezer has done a lot of work in this um, uh, area. The idea has been popularized in human genetics uh, by Peter Vischer and colleagues, but it's an older idea from, uh, that was developed by animal breeders where they try to basically figure out you know, which bull to breed to their cows to get next generation of cows that give you the most milk, things like that. Um, and there, it's actually a very sophisticated field, it turns out, uh, both experimentally and computationally, because very, very small differences make you enormous amounts of money when they're multiplied by 10 million uh, sized herds of cattle. So the idea here is that um, you'd like to measure a genetic, uh, the genetic contribution to a trait. And the sort of classic way of doing this is you look at individuals who have different degrees of genetic relationships. So you look at identical twins, si siblings, first cousins, et cetera, and kind of see how similar they are based on how much genome you expect them to share based on those relationships, right? That's kind of a pain and sort of heterogeneous and you're dealing with all of these generational effects. Um, and the realization uh, that, that's made here is that even though you're always told that you share uh, half of your DNA with a sibling, that's not exactly true, right? It's half on average, but the number of chunks that you inherit from each parent is small enough that it doesn't wash out to a half. Um, it washes out to a half on average, but the variance around that is actually pretty sizable. So this is um, a reasonably realistic um, uh, plot of the degrees of relationship. And you see that it's centered as it should be on 50% and it looks uh, you know, nicely normal. But um, the SD here is around 4%. So some of you will be only 46% related at the genome level to a sibling, and some of you will be 54% <laughs> related to your sibling. And if a trait has a genetic component, 
you should be slightly more similar to your sibling for that trait if you're 54% related than if you're 46% related. And it turns out that in a large sample, and given the precision with which we can now measure by sequencing how much of the genome you share, you can use those slight differences to very accurately back out different genetic contributions to a trait. Um, so, um, and you can, you know, you can, you can pull out the chunk that's not heritable, that's not of interest to us. You can pull out uh, the additive allelic effects, which means you just uh, look uh, at the locus and it has, you know, an A allele and a B allele, and one of them raises your trait and another lowers it. And then as you find additional such loci, you just add all of those effects up. Um, you can also use similar methods to back out the contribution of non-additive interactions between different loci, and then um, you can start uh, figuring out how much should go into higher order interactions and other sort of uh, genetic but not heritable but not obvious um, types of things. So here is this uh, plot where we've done that for 20 different yeast uh, growth traits. Um, and what you see is, um, they have a range of how heritable they are, right? So these bars, whatever is not colored in here, uh, to make it add up to one, that's the variance that's not genetic. That's basically how, how much variability is there in our measurement of that trait, or uh, just uh, whatever small differences in the environment we haven't managed to control even on the same plate. Um, but uh, basically, without exception, the largest contributor is always uh, these blue bars, which is the additive contribution of individual, uh, gen <laughs> of uh, different genetic loci. Um, they're, uh, they're for some traits, uh, you know, minimal and for some traits, decent sized contributions of locus by locus, uh, two locus interactions. And then a somewhat smaller component that's present for most traits, which is higher order interactions and other things that are heritable, but we don't understand what they are. Um, so, um, but of course, the other thing is we don't just have this overall measure of genetic relatedness. We have the measure of genetic relatedness at every single position in the genome. And we can do standard uh, QTL uh, linkage analysis to identify specific loci that, that make up um, this, uh, this uh, well, at first at least, this additive piece, and then try to look for these interaction effects as well. Um, so here is QTL mapping to identify additive loci for one uh, specific trait. And when we, uh, when, we when, we, when we do this with a smaller panel of 100 strains, we don't see anything across the yeast genome that turns out to be statistically significant. Once you scale this up to 1,000 strains, you end up with 16 uh, loci marked by these red asterisks here that are all uh, significant even after correcting for testing the whole genome. Um, and in this case, together they add up to roughly 100% of this additive genetic expect, uh, effect that we expected to see based on the mixed model, right? So for those of you who've uh, heard of the missing heritability problem, in this context we can pretty much uh, eliminate it just by scaling up our statistical power. Um, so that was one trait. Here's uh, all of the traits uh, we've looked at in this way. This is the genome-wide estimate of additive effects. This is the variance explained by the ad specific additive loci that we identify. Um, and you see that uh, in, the, in, this, uh, in this population, we can explain nearly all of it. I think the average is something like 95%. Um, this, of course, allows, once you have that kind of uh, ability to explain variance, you should be able to predict very accurately, and we, we can. Um, so here, once again, for one trait, is a cross-validated um, set of predictions where we predict a phenotype from a segregant that we hold out from our, uh, from our model based on an additive QTL model, and then we plot that against the actual phenotypic measurement. And uh, we do a very good job of being able to predict uh, this genetically complex trait. Um, so overall, uh, putting some numbers on this plot, we find that um, about 44% of the total trait variance we see uh, is these additive genetic effects that we can, all, that we can localize to individual QTL. 
um, and roughly a fifth as much comes from uh, pairwise genetic interactions, gene by gene interactions. There is a similar size chunk that's other heritable effects. And then this is kind of the average part that's uh, environmental or measurement based. We can also do um, these pairwise uh, QTL by QTL uh, scans to try to find these interacting loci, uh, interacting locus pairs where two loci have uh, an effect that differs from what you would predict it to be additively or where, whether there is no additive effect at all. Um, this is an example of what this looks like in practical terms because these interactions can sound a little abstract. Um, this is uh, growth on an alternative sugar, maltose. And you see that um, the segregants who inherit uh, both alleles at this chromosome 7 and chromosome 11 loci from the lab parent grow very poorly um, in, uh, on in the presence of maltose. And the same is true of that parent strain. The, the vineyard, uh, the, the, the segregants that inherit both of these alleles from the vineyard strain grow very well on maltose. And now under additivity, you would expect these two classes where you get one allele from each to be, to be about here, somewhere in between. And in fact, this class grows just as well um, that got the uh, vineyard allele just at chromosome seven as the one, uh, as the class that gets both alleles at that locus. And the one that just gets it at chromosome 11 grows almost as well. So you really need both of these to be of the lab variety to really uh, crash your growth uh, in, this, uh, in this condition. Um, this is uh, the, the kind of the cleanest, largest single effect that we've been able to find in this interaction space. So many of them are much more subtle deviations from, uh, from this linearity that you, would, uh, th that you would expect. So if we plot um, the fraction of the interaction variance that's explained by these QTL-QTL pairs, we'd like to see all of it to be um, you know, up here. Instead, in most cases, uh, we explain, you know, something like half, maybe 40% of the interaction by pairs we can detect, um, and which implies the existence of additional uh, locus, uh, locus pairs uh, that uh, give departures from additivity, but we still don't have the statistical power to pin them down to specific examples. Um, and that, um, once again goes back to this, uh, to, 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 to two things, right? Uh, so I showed you these power curves and here they are again, where in blue you have your power to detect uh, additive effects and in red you have your power to detect interactions that explain the same amount of variance, right? So uh, variances are always hard, uh, the interactions are always harder to detect than main effects. So this is shifted to the right. Um, but um, also shown here is our inferred distribution of effect sizes based on our data for additive effects in uh, blue and for interaction effects in this uh, pinkish reddish color. And you see that, that, that it looks like the, the real effects that are there are actually smaller. So we are less powered to, de to detect them even if they were the same size. Um, but they're also shifted toward uh, smaller effect sizes. So that's why uh, we basically, if you kind of integrate uh, the product of these things, we get uh, most of what's underneath this blue curve and miss a lot of what's underneath that pink curve. So I guess uh, for those of you who think about uh, GWAS in humans, the picture that's emerged kind of from uh, reasonably recent summaries of GWAS is that um, there is a chunk, uh, and that depends on the trait or disease in question, but it's uh, usually a relatively small minority of uh, known genetic contribution to a trait that's uh, detected GWAS QTL, so specific loci that you know uh, contribute to the trait. And then this is what's been called uh, the hidden um, heritability, where you can infer from these mixed models that it's just more of these more of GWAS QTL, but they are too small, and the studies have been too underpowered to detect them, but they should be there. 
And then there is an additional chunk that people argue about um, what is it because it's heritable and it's not, uh, it's not of this class. And is that interactions, is that rare variants? Uh, probably it's rare variants. Um, and what other things might be going on. So in yeast, we can show that when we push the statistical power enough, we can basically make uh, this class largely take over this class. So we have very little hidden heritability left. We can f for hidden additive heritability left. We can find almost all of it. And then we can start to pull apart this component and show that some of it is uh, detected gene by gene interactions. There is an additional kind of hidden interaction chunk uh, that we know is there, but we can't pin down. And then there is an additional class uh, that we still have some work to do in understanding. OK. Um, how are we doing on time here? All right, we're... Okay. All right, so um, I'll keep going. I guess I'm trying to think. I have two stories, and I'm trying to think about whether I should do both of them or one of them. You know, maybe I'll just do one of them, okay? So, um, I thought I'd talk about kind of a new cool thing that we've been uh, doing recently, and the first uh, iteration of this was uh, just published a few weeks ago. But the idea here is, to do, is something quite different and may well, uh, we hope will go uh, well beyond yeast, and that's um, doing uh, genetic mapping without crosses, right? So I just uh, explained to you, and this is the part of the talk that going off the PDF, the animation isn't going to work great, but uh, hopefully it'll be enough to see. I just went through a long example explaining how um, you can cross two strains and generate a panel of progeny and map genetic differences that way, right? Um, that has a couple of issues with it, despite all the power of what you can do with it. Um, one is that when you're trying to go beyond mapping something to a region of the genome and you want to find the actual gene or the actual mutation at that position, um, your uh, resolution of your genetic mapping is limited by how many genetic crossovers you can get due to natural recombination. And that's not something you really have any control over. That's set by your organism. And so all you can do is, you know, go more generations or increase your sample size, which can be laborious to the point of being infeasible. Um, so, um, so we'd like to be able to overcome that limitation. There are also regions of the genome differ in their recombination rate, and there are many hunts for uh, interesting genes and mutations in different organisms that have stalled after uh, they ended up in the recombination cold spot, and there was no way to really break it up, right? The other limitation is there are actually quite a few interesting examples in nature where despite what you may have been told in your evolutionary biology classes, you can take individuals from different species and they'll happily mate and generate viable progeny, but the progeny are infertile and so you can't go the next generation, you can't, uh, you can't reshuffle and recombine those genomes. But that space of trait variation is potentially a lot uh, richer than what exists uh, within species because you've gone kind of larger evolutionary distances. So um, we've been uh, playing with a way of overcoming that um, using CRISPR-Cas9. And the idea here is that um, occasionally crossing over can occur uh, not just in meiosis but during mitosis. So you have a regular old cell division and if um, during that cell division one of the chromosomes picks up a double-stranded break, um, you c they can undergo uh, they can undergo mitotic crossing over, and uh, once those events are resolved, you end up with what are called loss of heterozygosity events. You may have heard about these in the context of uh, cancer, where loss of heterozygosity can give you, um, you know, your two uh, your two hits, right? Um, so you end up with regions of the genome that instead of uh, being one copy from, one, from each of the parents, you've now replaced a chunk going out to the telomere from the middle of the chromosome uh, with two copies of the same thing. So that you kind of fix this break by 
flipping over to the other copy, right? So in, uh, there have, while there have been attempts to use this process for mapping type approaches, this is something that in nature occurs infrequently and is hard to kind of uh, pick up at any, uh, at any rate of interest. But the nice thing about the CRISPR-Cas9 toolkit is that now you can easily target these events um, to anywhere in the genome you want to with any desired density of these breaks, right? So um, you can, uh, as assuming that they're gonna resolve this way with high efficiency, you can start making panels where you just go along and march this event along a chromosome, making cuts and getting these panels of strains um, that are genetically the same for a chunk of the chromosome and they're genetically uh, dissimilar or heterozygous for the rest of it and move that breakpoint and figure out where that starts to have an effect on your trait of interest. Um, so there is your, there is your panel, right, of different genotypes and you can look for a point where um, up to a certain point they show one phenotype, but once you cross this line and your homozygous, uh, the region from this parent, you show, the, you show the opposite phenotype, and then you can localize your mutation of interest to this little, uh, to this little blue bar over here. So, um, so we tried this out in uh, the same, uh, with the, using the same starting pair of yeast strains, um, and we picked about 100 cut sites on one arm of uh, yeast chromosome seven, which came up in one of the previous examples. Um, so um, these sites, the key kind of thing to this method is that you can use, um, because uh, Cas9 targeting sites have this required PAM element, you can look for ones where a polymorphism uh, disrupts that PAM in one or the other strain, so you can cut only one of the chromosomes. And that uh, biases the repair toward this loss of heterozygosity process as opposed to kind of sticking them back together and doing other things you don't want them to do. So, um, so we did this and we were able to show that we can get lots of these loss of heterozygosity colonies. Um, we once again genotyped them by sequencing and here you can see that up to some point you get reads that only come from one of the parent strains and then for the rest of the chromosome you get the expected mix of the two strains. And then that, that break point uh, here it's um, you know, relatively close to the telomere, here it's been moved toward the centromere by changing the cut site. Um, and then we wanted to go ahead and try to map, oh, this is not showing up beautifully is it, um, sensitivity to um, to, man to growth in the presence of manganese. Um, so this is really not showing up uh, nicely here, is it? All right, well we'll, well, we'll, well, we'll, we'll flip to here. So we went through a couple of rounds of these panel constructions, right? And what, what you show here, what I show here is very fine-grained data where you have a bunch of these um, strains and what I'm where what's shown here is the, what's, what's along the x-axis is the position of the breakpoint in the region that we kind of zeroed in on for this trade. Um, and what's shown on the y-axis is the colony size uh, of how well the cells grow, right? So you see up to, um, the cuts being up to this point, um, the strains grow the same regardless of whether you've made the end of the chromosome homozygous for the lab allele or for the vineyard allele from that point outward, right? Which means everything um, from this point toward the end of the chromosome doesn't matter for growth in this trait. Whereas as soon as you cross this line, there is this very sharp division between strains that carry the lab allele and grow poorly in this, con in this condition, and strains that uh, doubled, uh, doubled up on the vineyard allele and grow very well um, in, these, uh, in, these in these conditions. So that allows you to, uh, with very high precision, zoom in on uh, this one uh, position here, which corresponds to a single amino acid difference within this um, PMR1 gene um, 
as your, as your candidate, right? So not only are you getting resolution. So if I were looking at kind of traditional genetic mapping, my uh, confidence region for where my trait is would be something like this entire slide, right? And here I've zoomed in experimentally, not only on uh, one gene within this interval, but one specific polymorphism in that interval, and I have reasonable confidence for separating it from um, the other four uh, possible uh, likely candidate variants within that one gene, one of which is something like 100 base pairs away from the site, uh, from the site of interest. Um, of course, we then w went ahead and tested it experimentally. So here are the two parent strains, and here's their difference in growth. And then what we did is individually moved as, uh, each one of these mutations one by one from the vineyard parent that grows well into the lab parent that doesn't. And for the four that were predicted to not have an effect, nothing uh, happens. And for the one that was predicted to have uh, the effect, you see a move uh, most of the way toward growing as well as the, uh, as the vineyard parent does. So this validates this very fine uh, ability to, to, to do that. Um, and what we've, been, uh, what we've been up to more recently is this idea that you can use this in cases uh, between different species. So here's uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, right? Our lab, uh, Baker's Brewer's yeast. Um, uh, and here are some of its close relatives. And uh, strains, um, you know, Cerevisiae versus uh, Banyanas have, some, uh, have genome diversity from each, uh, di genome differences from each other of over 20%. So you're quite far away in, in sequence space. But all of these guys will perfectly happily uh, um, hybridize together and make diploid cells that will grow vegetatively, but you can't put them through meiosis because of this high degree of separation. So we've been playing around making these types of cuts in crosses, in hybrids between Cerevisiae and Paradoxus, its closest relative, and we've shown that we can get the same types of targeting events, and now we're looking to see whether we can now um, easily experimentally map differences between yeast species versus yeast strains. Um, so uh, the first part of the talk, like I said, is largely uh, the work of Josh Bloom in the lab, um, the CRISPR-Cas9, has been a very fruitful collaboration between Meru Sadhu, a postdoc in the lab, and Josh. Um, and Frank Albert is a former postdoc in the lab who is now at the University of Minnesota running his own group. And his is the middle part that I didn't talk about. So um, thank you, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you.